MCBH, Marine Corps Base Hawaii. Wow, exciting. Okay, and we have today uh, uh, Spiros, Spiros. Uh, Spiros Kumparakis. Kumparakis, of course, I knew that. All right. <laughs> and, and we have Megan. Um, Megan is Megan Ostrom. That's easier. Uh, thank you for joining us today. You guys are in the environmental, you know, effort at Kaneohe. Um, so I have some questions for you. Welcome to the show. So um, wh why is Megan not in uniform? And um, Megan, you can still salute me if you wish. <laughs> well, Jay, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's great to see you again. Aloha. Thank you for having uh, uh, Megan and I back on uh, here with you today. Uh, I think we first met a couple of years ago. And I really appreciated that. Megan is one of our civilian Marines who help ensure the continuity and the kind of connection to Hawaii. And, and I'll let Megan talk a little bit about herself, but uh, she does a fantastic job of not only knowing uh, how to make sure we connect with the community, but also how to lead our efforts to uh, be part of the community. So this is yeah. about community then. Your environmental efforts are about community. And... Um, I, you know, I mean, the military has to avoid aggravating the community. It has to protect the environment. Marines are no exception. And uh, Kaneohe is um, right there in this pristine Kaneohe Bay, which is really an icon of, of environment. So uh, it's very important what you do. So, um, but let me, let me ask, uh, you know, uh, Spiros, what, what, what do you do? Is this all you do? Are you the commander? What is your situation? Well, uh, Jay, I'm the commander of Marine Corps Base Hawaii, and, and that's actually about eight properties across two islands. It includes Camp Smith, our Pualoa Range over at Eva Beach, uh, a small Pearl City annex and Manana housing uh, there in the Pearl City area. Uh, and it also includes Bellows uh, training area out by Waimanalo. Most people recognize Marine Corps Base Hawaii as the old Marine Corps Air Station uh, Kaneohe Bay, but uh, it's actually more than that. And as the commanding officer of the base, we have a kind of core missions. We like to say that our mission is to project power from our 7,800 foot runway that's located here in Kaneohe Bay. Uh, we produce readiness um, and we do that through our training and the training ranges we maintain. Uh, we promote resiliency. So what is that resiliency for our Marines, our sailors, and their families, as well as our civilians who work for us? And then ultimately, we protect our resources. So as you see in the emblem just over my head here, it's surrounded by those four Ps that we talk about. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about how we protect resources and promote resiliency, about half of our mission. It is I who should be saluting you, Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> but as last time, you know, I am always impressed to talk to commanders, especially Kaneohe, which is iconic, you know, been there like forever. And it's, um, it's provided Marines to go anywhere in the Pacific region. That's really fantastic. Um, how do you like your job? How can I get your job? Yeah. It's, uh, it's a really good job, Jay. I would first say the first thing you have to do is go back in time, just a couple of years, choose Marine Corps. Uh, and then uh, be fortunate enough to uh, survive some pretty uh, interesting jobs that I probably should have gotten fired for, and then uh, be lucky enough to be selected for what I think is probably one of the best jobs in the Marine Corps. And it's the fact that we, you know, a base like this in a place like this um, is where people raise their families. It's where Marines and sailors prepare for war or those things that happen less than war. And it also is in a, in a place with an incredible culture. Um, you know, the Mokapu Peninsula here at uh, Kaneohe Bay, connected to both Kailua, Kaneohe Bay, and even Heia, as the peninsula was part of Heia and its original Akwa. As you learn about that, and as folks like Megan have helped teach me over the last two and a half years, it just reminds you how special it is and why it's important to protect our resources because it is the only earth we've got. And if we don't really think about how we protect our resources, then, uh, then, then what are we all actually doing here to make sure that we can have a better tomorrow for our next generation? Right on. Also, it's got great Mongolian barbecue. 
<laughs> it, it does in the Friday night Mongolian barbecue still goes there at the jewel of the Pacific at the Marine Corps Bay, uh, Base Hawaii Officers Club. And the lounge is still a uh, pretty fun place to be on a first Friday. And your picture is there, except you're in Marine dress, right? I, I am a little bit more dressed up in, in the way too many pictures around the base of, of me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. It's really, it's always fun to talk to commanders. I, I you know, because um, I'm, I'm a civilian and I can say what I want and I really appreciate that. <laughs> well, Megan, uh, what, do you, what do you do for Spiros? So um, my role here at Marine Corps Base Hawaii uh, for Colonel um, Kumparakis is really uh, encroachment management and being aware and ready to manage those factors that can potentially negatively impact the ability of the Marines to um, be ready for deployment when they are called upon to whatever part of the world that they need to um, need to serve their mission. Encroachment factors um, have traditionally been thought of as those things that are right up against our fence line that can prevent Marines from reaching their readiness goals. So that could be development um, outside the fence line or um, within our airspace that negatively affects our aircraft. But kind of going back to what we talked a little bit about, you know, at the very start of the call with community, we look at um, encroachment really at a broader scale and how we are in our community together. And it's not just how we are as Marines here on the base, operating on the base. The Marines are part of the community, part of that external community um, outside of the base as well. And I'm sorry, I am trans. So it's a confluence of sorts. <laughs> you know, on one hand, you want to prevent encroachment. And Spiros, we had just some of this conversation before, I think, when we spoke we last did. time. Um, so it's two things. It's you want to prevent encroachment, you know, to uh, avoid any interference with the, you know, marine readiness and training. At the same time, you want to avoid factors that negatively impact the environment. So it's yeah, kind of an intersection of those two things. Um, that, that Spiros, can, can you help us with the intersection? How do those two things intersect? Well, see. Uh, one of the biggest things we try to do is have a space to conduct training. And we understand that a lot of our training uh, is impactful on our community. Uh, we have a, a fantastic training range down at Waimanalo, uh, in the vicinity of Waimanalo called the Marine Corps Training Areas Bellows. Uh, that's a perfect example of where the two come together. So we have a, a, an agreement with the city and county and there on the weekends at at uh, Bellows, we allow the city and county to take ownership so that around 12 o'clock on a Friday until about 08 in the morning on a Monday, that Marine Corps training landing area where we will conduct amphibious operations is actually turned over to the city and county and managed there on the weekend. And, and we appreciate that type of relationship. And I think that's a good example of the confluence of kind of resiliency encroachment where we say, let's be good stewards. Let's make sure we've got a place that we can conduct an amphibious raid and amphibious landing. But when we're not training on it, how do we make sure that there's access, uh, appropriate and controlled access to that beautiful resource for families to go and have a great time on the weekend? I think that's a great example. And Megan has uh, also continued to look for examples like that as we think about not just encroachment at the fence line, Right. We don't want a large building to grow up next to a base because uh, a nefarious actor might want to look in inside the base and see what's going on. That's kind of what most people think of when they think of encroachment. But we think of it more holistically. What about a watershed area that if there was development or growth or you know environmental damage to a watershed uh, that leads to the Board of Water Supplies, water supply that then leads to the base. Well, that's an area that we would really like to collaborate with the city, county, the state and our federal delegation to say, let's think about how we protect that resource, which is important to all of us, so that ultimately, as it flows down to the base and we're you know, buying that water from Board of Water Supply, we feel comfortable and safe that that resiliency is there. And that, so that's the kind of difference as someone who came from the mainland, who spent a lot of time on kind of East Coast DC, you might see it as it's the fence line, but here it's about a collaborative effort with the community for resiliency of the community, because we're definitely uh, not alone when crisis happens. And 
whether it's a hurricane, a tsunami, or an attack, uh, you know, just as we remembered yesterday and on December uh, December 7th, uh, the 81st anniversary, it, it impacts the entire community when there's an event. And so we want to be part of that conversation and we, we think we've got resources that can help. Oh, wow, I've had a lot of questions. So suppose, uh, let me start with this. Uh, I, um, <clears throat> Um, let me go. Let me let me um, go to Megan because um, I'll give her equal time. I hope that's okay. <laughs> so, so Megan, what you know? What kind of factors are environmental factors um, that you want to deal with? Uh, they may have you know also the call it the intersectional effect of affecting readiness, but there uh, might be five factors that affect the environment and and people get concerned about the environment. And of course, we all are concerned about the environment. So what can you do at Kaneohe? What can you do as the environmental person at Kaneohe to um, preserve the environment? So uh, we have a lot of exciting programs that are available to us with our encroachment management program. And many of these programs are not only um, available to us here in Marine Corps Base Hawaii, but they're available to us um, in our community as well, and actually predominantly intended for use outside of the fence line of installation properties. One of those programs is the Readiness and Environmental Protection um, Integration Program, the REPI program, uh, which you may be familiar with. And that program is a partnership opportunity. It's a partnership program that's funded through Congress. Uh, money goes to the office, office of the Secretary of Defense, um, where money is appropriated for conservation projects predominantly outside of military installations. And those conservation pro, uh, projects largely focus on those mo more landscape level type concerns, environmental concerns. Um, here at Marine Corps Base Hawaii, we're concerned about uh, threatened and endangered species, which um, we are federally required to protect and um, enhance their habitat so that we can continue our mission. We're required to um, look at resiliency, like the Colonel was speaking to regarding water. So what can we do to protect our upper watersheds so that it is um, maintained with those native species that continue to act like a sponge and absorb so that our aquifers can be recharged and the community as a whole can have fresh drinking water. Um, cultural resources are also something that are vitally important to us here at Marine Corps Base Hawaii. Um, on our installation, we are um, honored to be the caretakers of many different uh, sacred cultural sites and resources. And oh, was that so on Kaneohe Base? On the base, yes. Oh, and and, well, and likewise, yeah. it's very important that we care for those. But through some of these federal programs, we want to help the community and the state and the city and county and federal entities that are doing that excellent preservation work outside of our gates as well, so that there's continuity throughout the community as a whole, protecting all of our resources together as a collective. Okay, so th does that mean that you go out with a shovel sometimes and um, move the earth around, uh, or do you hire contractors to do that? Um, do you speak with the city and county? Do you speak with the state government, the LNR? I mean, you out there talking to, um, say, um, you know, as the Colonel mentioned, uh, uh, for example, a, a developer who wants to build a 39 story, story building to overlook the fence. Um, are, are you out there talking to people? Is that a part of your job? A big part of, uh, probably the biggest part of my job is being out in the community talking with people. If I'm in my office um, and people can find me easily, I'm not doing my job right, actually. <laughs> um, there'll be a note on my door that says, call cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and a big part of that is not just me getting out there connecting with people. It's making sure that our commanding officer is building those relationships in a meaningful and authentic way. It's making sure that our Marines are out in the community building those relationships. And yes, at some times it could be lifting a shovel. Um, other times it's a meeting. It's about inviting the community on to our installation properties as well with that controlled appropriate access and how we work together collectively. So you have a budget. You have a budget where you can hire a contractor, uh, what on behalf of what the Marine Corps, uh, where you can get things done, um, do environmental projects. Am I right? 
So I, I, I'll take this one. I, you know, I wish I had an unlimited budget, um, but obviously we have constraints, the fiscal constraints, and even something like a, a continuing resolution uh, can slow down our progress as we're trying to move forward. But what I will say is that, you know, as we look at three key elements, it's our natural resources, our cultural resources, and our uh, historical resources on the base, because we also have, you know, the importance of a place like Hangar 101, uh, which was attacked on December 7th, uh, 1941, and the very first Medal of Honor was given to, you know, at the time, uh, Chief Petty Officer John Finn, you know, important location that's actually a historic landmark, and then the cultural resources that can date back over 600 years, uh, and so those are the type of things that we want to protect. So we do have a, a fairly large environmental compliance team that's that are civilian marines and contractors. We've got PhDs, we've got archeologists, and we have folks who have well studied and well versed in uh, kind of native Hawaiian culture to make sure that we're not misstepping. And they're on site at jobs. So if we bring in a contractor to do work on the airfield to do repaving, they'll actually be an, a, a, an archeologist who will be on site so that if we were to find an archeological something of archaeological significance, say Evie or the bones of, of ancestors, we'll stop and then we'll start to work very closely with our partners like DLNR, uh, Bishop Museum, so many other and the Native Hawaiian organizations that we traditionally work with who have connections to the Mokapu Peninsula so that we don't do any missteps and, and anything wrong with the cultural resources of this space. That's very wise. So, uh, you know, the legislature is coming up in the middle of January. You're going to be down there. You'd be walking the halls, and if you're walking the halls, I'd be wearing a fatigue and a dress uniform. Uh, if, if I leave the base and I'm off base, I have to dress up. So I can wear this on base, but if I'm stopped and walking through town, and you, or if, Jay, if you see a Marine walking through town in this uniform, you can tell them, uh, Colonel Kuparaka said that's not accurate, that's not a Liberty uniform, and you need to get in a more dressy uniform the next time you're out in town. Yeah, I don't have to put her on report or anything, do I? No, just just a nice, subtle, tactful reminder is all we ask. <laughs> Tell them I was in the Coast Guard 50 years ago. I mean, maybe that'll <laughs> affect my influence. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, back in the day, um, and I guess it's not that easy to get out there for an ordinary person, but I, I visited the uh, firing range. And the firing range is actually in the write-up for this discussion. Um, the firing range is really beautiful at the far end there, at the right-hand side. I guess that's the east side of the base. And, um, you know, that's, you've got trained Marines to fire weapons. There it is. Um, but the, I suppose there's an environmental impact on that. Uh, what can you do to minimize that impact if there is one? Megan? Well, um, as Colonel spoke about earlier, our, our environmental team that we have um, here on the base they monitor for, you know, we do actually happen to have a red-footed booby colony that is thriving in the middle of our live fire range there um, in the colony and, and is growing. And as part of, um, you know, kind of that balance of, of having to sustain training and keep Marines ready, we also have that responsibility for environmental stewardship. And as that, we have measures in place that protect those birds and allow them to continue to um, live and thrive in the area. Um, we also have measures in place for our operational range clearance program that keeps um, our ranges uh, in, a, in a sustained factor. So we regularly um, clean those ranges, maintain those ranges for the overall um, use and enjoyment of our military readiness and our overall environment. So, um, yeah. I, I, go ahead, Colonel, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna add a surprising um, secondary effect from having a range like that. Uh, so the small island right behind that's not part of Marine Corps Base Hawaii is Mokomanu. Uh, because we conduct firing, people can't visit it on a normal basis. And as a result of us conducting training on the Ulapau Crater, we have cultural sites and natural resources that are actually thriving because we don't allow humans to go when we're firing weapons. And so that, that reduction of contact has made for some very special places. Uh, so it's interesting that because 
we bomb inside of a very tight window and square or we shoot weapons into a very tight window and square, uh, we're actually doing more to protect the a larger area behind it because people don't have access. Um, and the same holds true, when, and that's why we have to do that operational range clearance on a cyclical basis so that we can remove old either unexploded ordnance or lead material so it doesn't leach or move outside of our very, very controlled impact areas. How do you keep the uh, boobies, the booby birds uh, out of the line of fire? You know, by the way, I, I have a small Yorkshire Terrier and she would probably help you if you needed somebody to bark them away. But how do you, how do you keep them out of the line of fire? The, the, the boobies love a certain spot up by Battery, Pennsylvania. And we've tried over the past probably 10, 15 years to move them in a direction that would keep them away from the direct line of fire. And they will not. They have their spot. They really like it. And so we have actually moved our range mm -hmm. ever so slightly and changed our impact areas so as not to impact them. We've actually added uh, cannons that fire water suppression to keep any fires that might happen from hitting them and keeping them safe as well. So I, I think the, the mitigation has really worked and they are thriving in a spot that I don't know why they're th thriving so much. Ah, good. Uh, outstanding. You know, they are they're They also have an iconic quality about them, the booby birds, although they can be a nuisance. I know when you fly to the South Pacific islands, they, um, they're a risk in terms of getting into your engines. Uh, and so forth. Speaking of which, you know, I remember um, the time it was called uh, Kaneohe Marine Corps Air Base. Uh, you referred to some aircraft a little while ago. Um, are there still aircraft flying in and out of uh, Kaneohe, or is that history? How has it changed, and how will it change? So we're really excited right now. Um, so traditionally, this had been a maritime patrol base for the Navy with the PBY Catalinas and its original state. Uh, a few years ago, we had the P3s. Those squadrons have all deactivated. And now we have a permanent detachment of P8s that fly in and out, which is a fantastic detachment. So they're not actually home-based here. The home-based aircraft, the Navy to have two C40s uh, for logistics. And then the Navy also has HSM-37, which is their 60 Romeos, uh, which deploy with the uh, with the ships out of uh, out of Pearl Harbor. Now, for the Marine Corps, our two biggest squadrons are two VMMs, so which are the V-22 Osprey squadrons. And those are our two largest squadrons. We also have, we used to have the 53 uh, Sea Stallions and the HMLA, which is a light attack helicopters. Those two uh, squadrons have deactivated this year. We're going through an environmental process right now through the NEPA process for the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, we're conducting an environmental assessment, uh, looking at the historical as well as the cultural and the natural resources to see if bringing in C-130s and MQ-9s would be appropriate to home base here. And so we're reviewing that process, but within the plan, the Commandant of the Marine Corps believes he needs aircraft that can't not to fly around Hawaii, but to deploy from Hawaii. And so uh, we think that if this were to be approved and we move forward with it, that now you would have aircraft like C-130s or KC-130s, which can do refuel operations and equipment that can leave from Hawaii and go to Guam and the rest of the first and second island chain uh, in the Pacific, as well as MQ-9s. And we're not looking at a, a an attack variant. We're looking at a sensor variant that could you know loiter for many, many hours over some of our friends in the Pacific and, and let them know that we just want to know what they're doing. Yeah, and I suppose if you had C-130s, you could resupply uh, their, their supply, supply planes. Um, well, and so, the, uh, the, v, the V-22 uh, can actually be refueled off of the KC-130, so that V-22 that's local here can actually fly. And twice in the last two years, we've flown V-22s from Australia back to Hawaii and from Hawaii all the way to Guam, and and we had support from one of the Coast Guard KC-130Js uh, that are now out at Barbers Point, and they flew along with us to get to Guam. So it's a great maritime team right now. Yes. Oh, happy to hear that. So, Megan, how do you deal with people in the environment, you know, outside the base who say, planes? You want to fly planes over my head? How do you deal with that? Uh, it's, it's a lot of education, a lot of conversations, you know, and really helping people understand the mission 
as to um, why we train, where we train, um, and, and the need for our Marines and, and airmen and sailors and, and everything to, to be ready. And um, once you start having those conversations and you kind of explain it in that manner and, and, and not, um, you know, not in a passive way, but in a more personal way, like, you know, attending neighborhood board meetings, going to uh, Native Hawaiian Civic Club meetings or other um, community civic organization meetings, inviting people onto our installation to meet our, our pilots and our operators. Um, our community understands what we need to do and why we need to do it. And a part of that too is us also understanding you know, how we are in a community and that yes, the Marine Corps does have an effect on the community and being mindful of each other's needs, requests, and, and that it's going to be a give and take. But it's a, con it's a continual conversation that we have together. It's not something um, that happens in a vacuum or in a silo. It's, it's something that we will continually work through as a community. Well, I hope that conversation actually includes the notion of patriotism to the United States. And I think that's a driving feature, at least for me. Um, all you got to do is say, this is in the interest of the United States and I'm yours. Uh, and I think a lot of people could react that way. Just tell them this for the country, man, the country. Um, it's not a question of you and your NIMBY. It's, it's the country. Um, do, you, do you use that particular line of discussion? I think what we tend to focus on is there is a mission. There's a reason behind everything we do. And if there's a perception that we're doing it because we're jewelry riding around the island, we want to make sure we, we explain the why. There's a reason why a Marine will fly at night on MVGs to prepare for the most difficult flying they'll ever do. That's very difficult training, and they've got to get through those wickets. And if they don't train that way, then I don't want to send them into combat. And so we appreciate the patience that folks have with us. And when they do have questions, we're more than willing to answer them and hopefully uh, answer them in a way that makes sense. Respectful conversations are always good. It doesn't mean you're gonna, you're gonna win over a critic, but it does hopefully mean we have a, a dialogue that we can continue to discuss things in the future. If you have any hard cases, send them to me and I'll explain <laughs> the patriotism angle, okay? Uh, <clears throat> The other Thank thing is, uh, okay, so we have kind of a pivot, you know, Obama was talking about it a few years ago, and it's certainly coming true now for a lot of good geopolitical reasons. And, um, you know, Hawaii has to be strong, it has to be well, well staffed, essentially, uh, with the military. It's very important that we have the military, um, you know, present and functioning here in Oahu and all through the islands. So um, people say that, in, you know, in the future, there'll be more. Uh, and the, the pivot goes for a while. And um, assuming that, um, how does that change things for Kaneohe uh, Marine Corps Base? Because you might see more troops there. You might see more of a, a mission, more training, um, more of a, a hub, if you will, of uh, military activity in the Pacific. How does that look to you, Colonel? Well, I think we're already there. Uh, I think our Commandant General Berger, who was actually stationed here, understood the importance of Hawaii and, and over three years ago started coming up with something called force design. And so we're already two years into that force design. I think the, the units and the type of fighting we'll do will be different. Um, they may be smaller a little more agile and need to be able to get into places quickly. So when we talk about MQ-9s and KC-130s, and then we talk about this group called the 3rd Marine Littoral Regiment, which was the old 3rd Marine Regiment, it's already redesignated and we're looking at how they conduct training. They deployed as an MLR out to the Philippines last year or earlier this year at Balakatan. They'll deploy again to the Philippines to build that continued relationship as Balakatan shoulder to shoulder. And they're a unit that could does something other than just clothed with destroy the enemy by fire maneuver. They, we're bringing in new systems like uh, anti-ship missiles that can be fired from the shore. Uh, we're looking at integrating sensor packages that uh, give target quality data so that if a commander needed to punch a hole in the side of a ship, you don't have to just think about another ship doing it, but Marines could actually do that on the commander's behalf. Wow. So, we, you know, we've been through a couple of um, wars in Middle East, Central Asia, you know, and um, the Marines have been there and they're always there. And I wonder how that's changed, uh, you know, not only the rules of engagement, but the manner of engagement and thus 
the training for engagement. Um, have you have you seen that? I'm sure you I'm sure you have seen it in your career about how how a, a marine force, a, a large or small, operates differently in, in a world that's different. Well, I think the first thing is we've got a lot of great experience uh, from. Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. Um, and we want to take those lessons learned and apply them to a different dynamic. Uh, the rules of engagement will be different in the Pacific. I think the biggest thing that's different is our the number of allies that we have that are uh, in harm's way, if you will, and the type of weapon system a potential adversary has. It, it makes the stakes very, very high. It doesn't give you the dominance in the air that you might have had over Iraq or Afghanistan. And so it makes us think about how we're going to deploy and create what we call the stand-in force. Uh, the Marines who are located in Hawaii, most of their bosses are in Japan. They are part of the stand-in force. And we don't do anything without our partner, the Japanese, uh, without the Australians, without our New Zealand partners, and our growing and continuing relationship with the Philippines. And of course, Korea, you know, our only place that's actually on the continent. We have Marine bases and Army bases there in Korea. And so it's a dangerous uh, neighborhood. Um, and the biggest danger is probably a natural disaster. And so while we have to think about competition and fighting against a pure threat, we also have to think about the, the, the continued uh, and most likely action, which is uh, the United States and its assets coming to save people's lives after a natural disaster. And so we want to be prepared for all of those types of operations. And that kind of drives the size of force you want here in Hawaii. And the other thing Hawaii provides, it's a path through, pass through location. We call it a regional support activity. So not only do we need to be prepared to send Marines away, but as a Marine expeditionary unit flows through from California or aircraft come through, this should be a place where they can rest for a few minutes, rearm, and then get them to where they need to go to conduct the missions of the United States. And I think that holds true for the entire joint force, for the Navy, for the Air Force, uh, for the Coast Guard, for for us, uh, the Army, it truly is the Middle Pacific that provides that regional support activity. Now, people always wonder, you know, they, they wonder whether in, in the case of, for example, extreme weather or some other kind of, you know, natural disaster um, or worse, um, whether the military in Hawaii will be there to help the civilians. And uh, I take it from what you're saying, the answer to that is yes. Um, and that we need not be concerned that if uh, some, for example, hurricane hits Hawaii, which is, you know, is likely to do one of these days, um, that uh, the Marines and all the other services as well will stand up and help people even in a time of great distress. Am I right? Uh, you're correct. We actually have plans ready and, a, and teams ready to do those uh, direct support to civilian authority missions, discommissions here in Hawaii. And, and our base becomes an important hub, as well as the Army and Navy and Air Force bases become important hubs to support our local authorities. And I'd say the other piece to this, to come back to the environment, you know, our president, our secretary of the Navy, our, De our secretary of defense have all talked about climate change. And, and I would say the Department of Defense and the military and here at Marine Corps Base, Base Hawaii, we understand that the climate is changing. And so we have to build a resilient base with the appropriate funding to make sure that we can we can survive as you know tides continue to rise as uh, as types of weather events become more erratic and less and you know more difficult to to uh, forecast we need to make sure that we're looking at you know engineering with nature in mind so that we have that resiliency so that if we are hit our bases are those resilient places for the community yeah it's like when you fly in a plane and the oxygen mask is supposed to come down over your head. They tell you the adult should put it on first so that the, the adult can help the child. It's the same thing. You have to be ready to help us, and you're not going to be ready unless you're not only sustainable but also resilient. But I would be remiss if I did not ask Megan about the base. <laughs> the base. Um, the Kaneohe Marine Corps base. It is yeah. beautiful. It has always been beautiful. It is a long tradition of being beautiful. And when you drive through the base, you see such care, such attention um, to every open space and every building, every sign, every roadway. 
Is it, is it still like that, Megan? And what do you have to do with that? Are you down there mowing the lawn too? Uh, <laughs> that would be fun from time to time to jump on one of those riding mowers. I think that might be more enjoyable than <laughs> responding to email. But, um, <laughs> you know, I have the, you know, been fortunate enough to have been born and raised here in Windward, Oahu, and now continuing to live here and work um, just down the road from my parents. Uh, raise my kids here now and every day I drive in and I get to you know come through Kailua onto a little bit of the H3 and look out and see Kaneohe Bay on one side Kailua Bay on the other and drive and look at the Nuupia ponds which are beautiful and Marine Corps Base Hawaii has spent over 20 years restoring those ponds when I was young those ponds were completely choked out with mangrove and you couldn't see any of the open water. The habitat wasn't there for the um, endangered native water bird species. Now that habitat is there and it's thriving. And, and, and that's in thanks to, to the Marine Corps. And it doesn't mean that, um, you know, that, it's, that they're done. The work continues. The environmental improvement here continues. The team um, is never stopping to explore those opportunities here on the base um, and then in partnership with the community as to how can we continue to keep this place beautiful and make it beautiful for the years to come while the Marine Corps are the stewards of this peninsula. You know, as Miro, I, I just remembered that one of your predecessors a couple of commanders ago was like so into environment and energy, you know, clean energy that, uh, you know, I, I was on the Energy Policy Forum at the time. Um, this commander was like everywhere. Um, and he was famous within the energy community. Um, do, do you remember who that might be? Uh, he retired a long time ago, but uh, it was quite something the way the Marines were presenting on clean energy at the time. So I don't know which commander it was off the top of my head, but I've talked to several of the commanders then, whether it be my predecessor, uh, Colonel Lyonez, uh, his predecessor, Kid Colleen, uh, and Toaster Anna Carrico. Uh, there's just a, a lot of history and tradition of the base commanders. Uh, in fact, I still talk to many of them there. One is uh, Babar. He was a fantastic commander here. He was the first colonel who was selected on a board to be the commander. Babar Rice was his name. And so I get a chance to meet them once every, every once in a while, and we talk about just how things are going. Clean energy, energy reduction, uh, any way that we can re reduce the demand uh, on HECO and the local community is, is fantastic. But at the same time, we also have ACs that aren't only running in our housing, but go down to server farms to make sure that, that servers are going to stay cold enough to, to keep a data center open. And, and those types of things and, and keeping very, very sensitive equipment and large aircraft or large technical equipment in an air conditioned space that uses up a lot of energy. So for me, it's not just about the environment, but it also costs us a significant amount of money to the taxpayer per year. So we do it and we look for opportunities, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's the right thing on so many levels, both for the environment as well as to the bottom line and the taxpayers dollars that we're charged with managing. You know, I, I asked you before how I could get your job. I'm, I'm even more focused on that now. I, I, you must love your job. You sound like you love your job. And it's, it's I, great. I, I love the job because we're surrounded by incredible people who love this place more than I do because they grew up here and they want to make sure it's taken care of. And then the question is leaders, right? We always ask ourselves, are we listening to our people? Are we listening to the community? Are we taking the advice? And then how do we make decisions that in a very short amount of time as a commander create positive change in the right direction? And so uh, the good news is we've got such a great team. The bad news is budgetary constraints only allow you so much discretionary spending. And so as we look to that little discretionary we have, we want to put it in the right places. And we think protecting our base and the environment and the resiliency of our community is a really good place to invest taxpayers' dollars. But Megan, how much of that do you agree with? Oh, I completely agree with it. And, and adding on top of that is that's where our partnerships come into play. So earlier you were asking, you know, well, who do we work with? And 
and it's it is it's the department of land and natural resources it's the city and county of honolulu it's the university of hawaii and and the research and innovation that they're doing here on our installation with you know wave energy testing locations offshore and then um you know we've got hawaii institute of marine biology you know right in our backyard as well that we partner with um it's looking at that resiliency in the community so we on the peninsula, we are dependent on resources coming in from the outside. So there are programs, you know, thanks to our uh, federal delegation who advocate for these things in Washington, D.C., where there are grants available to our military communities to help with resiliency, for energy resiliency, for our water infrastructure, for our roadways, because this base is sustained not only by Marines, but by their civilian workforce who live in Kaneohe, Kailua, um, some even, you know, over the mountain in Eva. And um, we all depend on having those resources available to us to, to be ready to, to serve in, in our own way. Yeah. And and I, we, I have to second uh, that. Go ahead, go ahead. I have to second that, uh, you know, as we work with all levels of elected officials from our neighborhood boards up to the federal delegation, uh, we've seen it. Uh, time and time again, and I've seen it in the last two and a half years, our federal delegation is doing a fantastic job to ex explain to the rest of the United States why Hawaii is important. And when they do that, it helps, it actually comes back to help not just the local community, but the readiness of the military forces here and the command and control from, you know, Admiral Aquilino and Indo PACOM all the way down to a Lance Corporal who needs to be ready to get on a plane tonight just in case there's, there's something going wrong in the world. And Hawaii supports that. So going back to your comment about about patriotism, that, that's really what it's about. Do we have Lance Corporals ready to follow an admiral's orders to go make the world a better place? And who does an ally want? Who wants to have an ally that also doesn't care about the environment? And I think when you look across the world at how other countries are taking care of their own resources and how we take care of ours, it is a factor that makes us the ally of choice in the world. Thank you both. And thank you for your service. Okay, Spiro, Megan, it's been a great discussion. Really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today on Think Tech. I hope we can meet again soon. Um, the Colonel and me, we have a thing going. We're gonna do this again and again. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, I, I just want to thank you again. And I still remember the comment you told me. It was very, it, it really hit home with me. It's like when you come over the poly or the H3 and you see that peninsula and you said, oh, that's my big brother. It, he's quiet right now, but if someone pushed me around, my big brother is going to come and punch you in the mouth. <laughs> and so we still are your big brother ready to go punch somebody in the mouth. We want that. We look to you for that. Thank you both so much. Aloha. Thank you. All right, Jake. Aloha. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.